right. Uh, well, I guess we'll get started. I think we have everyone um, that was in the waiting room now in the session. So um, we will uh, start off today's session here today. So um, welcome everyone uh, to the CNSC's first live broadcast of Science Literacy Week. Uh, my name is Erica and I am the research manager here at the Churchill Nor Northern Study Center. And I'll be hosting today's event. And I'm also joined by um, our intern, uh, Jordan, who will be managing the tech side of things. So he'll be watching the group chat if anyone has any questions that they want to put in there uh, throughout um, the session. So we're streaming from our um, library here at the center. We really wish that this could have been an in-person event, but I'm happy that everyone can join us virtually um, so we can actually make, make this happen. Um, so just to outline the session today before we actually jump into it. So um, first we'll have a quick introduction um, as well as a short presentation by our special guest. And then we'll follow that with a quick Q&A session um, for the remainder of the, our time here today. So as I mentioned, Jordan will be managing the um, chat throughout the um, event. So if you have questions for the Q&A session, just put them in there and he will forward them along to me um, as, we, as we go along. So we also had some questions already submitted, so we have tons to go through. So we'll try to keep it at the half hour. Um, so uh, Jim, maybe keep your answers <laughs> um, concise. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I'd also like to encourage people to use the side-by-side -side feature in Zoom. You can find this by clicking the top three dots in the right-hand corner of your screen um, or clicking on viewing options um, so that you can see the host um, as well as the screen sharing at the same time and that allows you to adjust the size depending on what you're looking at. Uh, a final housekeeping item is that we will be recording this session and posting it on our social media later um, so people can look at it after the event is over. All right, so with that, we'll jump into a quick introduction. Um, so this year's Science Literacy Week event, uh, the theme is actually biodiversity. So the CNSC decided to host two live broadcasts, one today uh, and one tomorrow, highlighting some of the amazing biodiversity we have here in Churchill and more specifically subarctic biodiversity. So for those who haven't been to Churchill, although I see not a lot of names of people who are, are either currently here or have been here in the past, um, Churchill lies at the transition zone between the Arctic tundra and the boreal forest. So we have an intense amount of biodiversity in both of those ecosystems. Um, so we decided to highlight both of them um, through today's session and tomorrow's ses session, as well as the uh, researchers that study these areas. Um, so without further ado, I will introduce our uh, guest today, Dr. Jim Roth, who is joining us from Winnipeg. So Jim has been coming to um, Churchill since the 90s or since before I was born <laughs> to study mostly small mammals and food web interactions, although he has studied a lot of both abiotic and biotic features of both the boreal and tundra ecosystems and is, is a wealth of knowledge when it comes to biodiversity in the area. So uh, I'm going to pass it over to Jim for his uh, presentation. Oh, uh, unmute him first. There you go. <laughs> you didn't give me power to uh, unmute myself. <laughs> That's okay. Well, thank you, Erica. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, very excited to be here. I'm going to um, oops, share my screen and um, get my PowerPoint up. There we go. Can you see that okay? Boreal forest biodiversity. That's great. <laughs> All right, cool, thank you. So yes, so I'm a professor at the University of Manitoba, started coming up to the Churchill area to look at biodiversity on the tundra and in the forest um, in, uh, uh, well, long, oh, quite a while ago when I was a graduate student. Um, what a cool place to understand biodiversity because you've got this intersection of these different ions and looking at the movements of organisms and, and uh, energy uh, between different biology violence between the forest and the tundra and in the marine environment as well. But so our focus today is on the boreal forest. And the first question is, what does boreal mean? What do we mean by boreal? Well, boreal basically means northern. Boreal is northern, austral is southern. And the, the uh, father of boreal ecology, I would say, um, defined boreal as areas where snow 
affects plants and animals or where organisms have evolved adaptations for dealing with snow. So snow is really important um, in these obviously northern areas and how organisms respond to them. So we're talking about um, the boreal forest. It's also called the taiga. I use those terms interchangeably. Um, northern coniferous forest. And then north of that is the tundra, where you get land without trees. And then the forest tundra ecotone, the transition between the taiga and the tundra are really important um, areas as well, like right where Churchill says. So the taiga and the tundra are the primary terrestrial biomes in the north. And they cover really broad parts of both North America and um, Europe and Asia. Um, it's actually the, the taiga is the largest terrestrial biome in the world. So big, big areas. Um, covering that. But actually most forests are, have really been highly impacted by people. So Canada's boreal forest is considered the largest remaining intact forest uh, in the world. If you look at where um, you still have forests compared to where it was uh, years ago when uh, agriculture was, was uh, first uh, became a thing in the world. So actually, it, when you're looking at, at these northern environments compared to tropical environments, there's not a whole lot of species. There's actually just a few tree species in the boreal forest, mostly conifers, a few broadleaf trees, um, mostly along waterways. But in North America, across the entire boreal forest, there's really just nine tree species um, that dominate uh, this ecosystem. Six of those are conifers. And up in Churchill, we really just have three um, primary tree species, white spruce, black spruce, and um, tamarack. So all these species that live in these areas have to have adaptations for dealing with the conditions they're experiencing in the, the um, boreal forest environment. So um, we're talking about cold, we're talking about drought, and low nutrient conditions. So why do conifers do so well in this kind of environment? Well, they must have adaptations to be dealing with with these characteristics that these um, experiencing in these, these, uh, this climate. Um, one is that they are, they don't lose their leaves. Most of them anyway, keep their leaves year round so they can photosynthesize, photosynthesize whenever it, it gets warm enough. So it's gotta be warm enough for the chemical reactions um, to occur. They don't do it as efficiently as broadleaf plants, but they don't have to because they don't have to grow new leaves. That's a huge energy expenditure. Broadleaf plants has to put out new leaves. Um, every spring. They've got, they're by and large a pretty dark color, which helps the foliage absorb as much energy as possible from the sun. So they can start photosynthesis as soon as possible in the, uh, in the spring at the start of the growing season. And they've got this conical shape, which helps them shed snow. So we had a huge um, snow event here in Churchill last fall in early October that damaged tons of trees around town. So you, could, you couldn't drive up and down the street because there'd be big limbs from, from trees blocking, blocking the, uh, uh, the roads. But if you look at them, those were all deciduous trees. The, the conifers that we have did fine. They don't experience this a lot, but often enough to, to have this adaptation so they can deal with the really heavy wet snow that we experienced um, that these deciduous trees were not too happy about. Conifers also have, um, are good at dealing with drought and low nutrients. One of their best adaptations for dealing with drought is, are their needles. So their leaves, instead of le big leaves like a maple, are in the shape of needles. And this is, um, helps them deal with the loss of water. So when they start to photosynthesize, when it starts to get warm, warm enough because they're so dark, they can start to photosynthesize pretty early. Often the ground is still frozen. So they are opening up their, um, their uh, stomata to, for gas exchange, they lose water while they're sucking up uh, CO2. So that's how plants eat, right? They take sunlight, um, they, they use the energy from the sun to turn um, CO2 into carbohydrates. And while they're doing that, um, they're also losing moisture. And if the ground is still frozen, they can't suck up new water from their roots. And so they're really susceptible to drought, especially in the springtime, where they're starting to photosynthesize, um, but can't yet get liquid water. So their um, narrowness of these needle-shaped leaves reduces the surface area through which they, they can lose uh, water. Their stomata, where they do this gas exchange, are sunken, protected from dry, drying winds. And they've also got, most of their needles have this thick waxy coating, which is, which is a waterproof, waterproof cuticle, which also uh, prevents um, loss of moisture. 
Now, boreal soils are really pretty lousy. They're really cold. They don't have any nutrients. And decomposition is really, really slow. Um, so because they don't lose their leaves, it remains shady year-round. Um, so they don't get a lot of sunlight uh, to warm up the soil. They intercept snow, these, these branches do, which would, if it made to the ground, would, would provide a, a thick layer of insulation, keep the ground from getting so cold. And their needles are actually acidic. So when they're dripping water uh, off their needles, they're dripping acid into the soil, so which also um, slows down decomposition. So it's, it's cold. Um, permafrost develops really readily under these soils. It's acidic. You don't get a lot of nutrients um, released by decomposition. So soils are really nutrient uh, poor. But plants have associations with other organisms to help them get nutrients. So they, most of the plants in the boreal forest have these mycorrhizae, these little fungi that are these really, um, that associate with the roots of these plants. Uh, it's hair-like, little root-looking structure, but it's actually a fungus. And the fungus helps the plants absorb nutrients from the soil because it's so hard to get nutrients because there aren't very many of them much more efficient in nutrients by, by associating with these fungi. And then the fungi get carbohydrates from the plant where they're, that they're uh, producing by photosynthesis. So you get this lovely mutualism between the plants and the fungus working together um, to make life better for both. Now we also have predators in the forest and predators actually also can affect nutri nutri nutrient concentrations in soils um, and nutrient availability for plants, um, especially on their den. So, uh, predators like foxes will produce dens, den sites in the forest and they raise their pups and all these pups are urinating and defecating and the, the parents bring back food which decomposes um, on, on the ground and so they're leaching nutrients into the soils and you get much higher nutrient concentrations actually on fox dens. So I actually had a grad student who was looking at that and found both nitrogen and phosphorus con uh, concentrations in the organic layer of the soil, the upper soil layer, um, were much, much higher, twice as high, or over twice as high uh, concentration of nutrients in the soils on dens compared to off dens. And that has a big effect on the kind of plants that you find growing. Some plants are well, better adapted at low nutrients. Some need really uh, a lot more nutrients to flourish. And if they can get high nutrient into a higher nutrient environment, then they can outcompete. Um, um, other plants. So on fox dens, you actually found more tall shrubs, more grasses, more forbs, not as many lichens, and not as many these little um, tiny prostrate shrubs that are pretty common uh, in, uh, in the boreal forest and our control sites. So changing the functional diversity through denning and by concentrating nutrients, actually, we're getting different kinds of plants growing on our dens compared to our control sites. Overall, foxes are enhancing the biodiversity of the forest by creating different availability of nutrients and the species uh, that are responding to those. Then it also actually makes trees grow bigger. So uh, white spruce, so we had, we actually looked at the tree rings, record trees and look at the tree ring width of trees growing up on fox, fox dens, um, looking at white spruce specifically, and they were growing faster on the den sites compared to on the control trees. Just 50 meters away, trees don't grow as big. Uh, they grow taller on dens and they grow um, bigger around, uh, faster um, cross-sectional growth uh, as well. And trees on fox dens actually produce more cones. Um, we get more than twice as many cones growing on the trees when they are able to take, a, or take advantage of the nutrients that are provided by the foxes, at least in a non-mast year. Um, spruce and, and a lot of other trees are, are considered masting species. A mast occurs when they, in one particular year, they produce tons of cones. All the trees in the area will reproduce at the same time, produce lots of cones. And then, the, then for several years following that, they produce not very many cones at all, um, which is thought to be a, an adaptation to avoid predation. So they can swamp the predators, uh, one year. Otherwise, the predators will eat all the seeds if they produce kind of the same amount of seeds uh, every year. So um, by providing nutrients, though, the trees that are able to access the nutrients on the fox dens are able to reproduce more in these other years. And these, so you might expect the herbivores to respond to these uh, increased seed availability. So red squirrels are, um, are probably the most important seed predator in the boreal forest. And so we have speculated that these clever foxes 
are fertilizing the trees, creating more food for um, one of their prey species. See if they can lure those squirrels in to eat all the seeds, those sly foxes. So most conifers, because they don't lose their leaves, are considered accumulator species. They hoard minerals and nutrients. They don't recycle them because they don't lose their leaves until a fire comes through. So fires are often needed to break down dead plant material, release nutrients, restart succession. And the boreal forest is considered a disturbance-based ecosystem. Uh, disturbance is really important um, in the boreal forest, especially fire. The boreal forest is commonly dominated uh, by fire. It's routinely subjected to these large-scale natural um, disturbances. If you look over the range of the boreal forest, so this is just one map showing all the fires that occurred in a 20-year period. And pretty much the entire boreal forest, um, or a good chunk of the boreal forest was burned. It's not that, that most areas of the boreal forest will burn every 100 years to 200 years. Really common feature of the landscape. Um, important for releasing nutrients, um, reducing the litter that accumulates on the, on the forest floor. Um, and because decomposition is so slow, these nutrients get tied up and fire releases them and makes them av available for other plants and allows sunlight to come through. Um, opens up the canopy, stimulates re regeneration from of plants from seeds and roots, stimulates growth and reproduction. So some species won't reproduce at all unless a fire has gone through, unless they've been exposed to fire. So fire is pretty important. So the, um, it is a pretty dynamic ecosystem because it's disturbance-based. And this disturbance doesn't happen every place at the same time. Um, you end up getting these patches of burn, or recently burned versus other areas which were burned not so recently. So you get quite a lot of heterogeneity on the landscape, which elevates overall species diversity. Some species do better in these early successional um, stages. Some do better in the, in the later successional stages. So, Actually, not only are our species richness lower in the boreal forest relatively uh, uh, to uh, elsewhere, there's actually lower species richness of, of birds and mammals and other species as well. But that helps people like me who are really interested in understanding food webs. So my pr research program primarily is really interested in looking at food web interactions, how one species affects another directly and then indirectly. So if you have changes in abundance of, of snowshoe hares, how does that affect their um, predators? And then when snowshoe hare populations crash, you've got all these predators um, that are uh, occurring at a, at a higher density in the landscape. They must switch to feeding another other things. So you can have potentially hares affecting um, grouse or ptarmigan um, in, in the forest. So these are the kind of interactions that I'm really fascinated by. And because there are fewer species overall, um, that means we actually have an opportunity to maybe understand um, how these changes in the months of one species might be affecting another. And because you've got fewer species, there's less species redundancy, changes of one species, uh, which are pretty common because you have really unstable population dynamics in the boreal forest, more likely to have population cycles in the north than you are elsewhere. Um, it's a great opportunity to look at these changes, these dynamic events, and see how things change over time and over, over space. So, um, that's just a quick blurb on, on boreal biodiversity. I actually teach an entire uh, lecture, our entire semester uh, course on this topic. So um, that was just a little quick uh, intro, but thank you and be happy to answer any questions. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jim. Um, that was a lot of information in a short amount of time. I think I have a lot of questions. I learned a lot, so I'm hoping other people have some questions for you as well. Um, but I guess I'll start off with a question that I have um, myself. Um, so you talked a lot about some of the harsher conditions that we have here in the boreal forest, like, um, you know, harsher winters, poor soil, um, drought, things like that. So why does this ecosystem have such a diversity of species? Why do they choose to come here despite all of those conditions? Well, species in the north, um, well, you don't just get to go where you want to. You go to where you can make a living. Right? And the species that are in the north are, have evolved adaptations for dealing with those, that challenging environment that other species might not have. Um, and that's part of the challenge of climate change. So climate change, so species in the boreal forest and out on the tundra um, have evolved adaptations dealing with the harsh abiotic conditions. So if the abiotic conditions are becoming less harsh, then it's more mild than these broad southern species, which are used to um, hanging out in more 
more less challenging conditions may be able to tolerate the abiotic conditions and may then um, outcompete, um, act as predators on these northern species, which are well adapted to the ecosystem. So, so that's kind of the, the biggest concern um, for, for what I think is that one of the bigger concerns for climate change is that, that species from the south are going to move moving north. Um, so these northern species, it's not that they choose to come here, it's just that they can. They're, they're, they're tougher than the southern species. Um, they, can, they can deal with it. They've evolved adaptations for dealing with low temperatures, low food availability for the, the, uh, the herbivores and the predators, um, extreme seasonality. Um, they're there because they can, they can do it and the southern species can't, but the southern species might be able to do it more in the, in the future as the conditions get more mild. Right, then that, that actually leads me to one of the questions that was sent in in, in terms of climate change. Um, so obviously biodiversity is um, very interconnected. So when we're talking about an ecosystem like the boreal, which you very clearly explained, explained is very interconnected, very dependent on each other and um, things like that. How might um, species be affected if in terms of climate change, one is more or disproportionately affected, um, how, might that, how might that trickle down the line in terms of other species in the ecosystem? Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting, interesting question. So uh, that, that relates to, I had another dozen slides that I figured I better not show because I had already tried to get a whole semester worth and you only gave me 10 minutes. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, there, because there are fewer species, there's less redundancy. So loss of one species actually can have a bigger effect on lots of others in the in the environment, um, if they're not often operate or occupying similar niches. Um, so if you've uh, so yeah, one species is lost, it's going to have um, yeah, things are going to change for for lots of other species, uh, just because of that interconnectedness that we have in uh, in this environment. Right. Okay, so I have some uh, questions coming in. Um, so I'll start with one from uh, Jess Fortelli, who is a researcher that comes to Churchill. Um, and she has a question about the um, fires that you're referring to and how it is a disturbed ecosystem. Uh, she asked, how are those, con are those controlled fires or is there a fire season up north? Well, there's a fire season, but those are not controlled fires. So fires occur naturally um, uh, uh, without, I think it's some. 80 some percent of the area that's burned is usually started by lightning. And so they're, they're not managed, they're not controlled burns uh, like we have. That's a, that's a mechanism for, for um, managing forests that we more commonly see down south. Um, you know, the north of boreal forest is so sparsely populated by people, it's, it's, it's hard to, well, manage by fire, manage such a large area with so few people, so remote areas. Um, and then control them if they are started uh, naturally as well. So uh, fire season, I think, is usually early, early on. And there's some years that are that are drier than others. Or if you've had a long time in some particular area with with fuel um, building up, um, a lot of combustible fuels on the ground, and then you get a lot uh, uh, dry season. Then yeah, that's a that's a season that you're more likely to have uh, fires occurring. Right. Awesome, thanks for that. Um, so I think we have about five minutes left. So I think this will be our final question um, for today. Um, so this one's coming from Malik Kai. Um, sorry if I'm not pronouncing that correctly, um, but he's wondering, firstly, he loved your presentation and he's wondering um, when foxes produce extra nutrients in the area that helps with plant growth, but does it also help those animals that are eating those plants? Oh, great question. So we have, I think so. We haven't tested that specifically on the fox dens in the forest, but we have looked at that in the fox dens on the tundra. So you're, the, tomorrow's topic is, is, is the tundra, um, but what we, what we found there probably applies similarly here. So these nutrients that are at higher concentration in the soil get, probably will get passed up into the plants. So nitrogen, for example, is a limiting nutrient. You'll find a lot of herbivores, which will be going after the most nitrogen-rich parts of plants or the, the um, 
new growth, which has higher nitrogen anyway. It's a nitrogen concentration. So herbivores do grow after the tastiest parts. And so we think that these nutrients probably go up into these boreal um, plant species and that the herbivores will be attracted um, to those plants for that reason. And then if they're small enough, maybe get munched by a fox. Yeah, great question. Um, awesome, well, I think that's all um, we have time for today, unless anyone has a last minute question they wanna throw into the chat. Um, but while I give time for that, I just wanted to thank everyone for coming to this event. Um, and a big thank you to Jim for joining us today. And if you enjoyed yourself and you want to come back tomorrow, at the same time, we'll be focusing on the tundra ecosystem with Jim's PhD student, uh, Sean. So, um, oh, I did pronounce the name correctly. Awesome. And thank, thanks for coming back tomorrow. Um, we're excited to see everyone back here at 2.30. And if you have any questions in the meantime, you can email me ahead of time. So you are sure to have your question answered. It's research at churchillscience.ca. Great. Um, well, thanks everyone. We're going to sign off now, but we'll see you back here tomorrow. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. That was fun. <laughs>